Welcome, welcome. We are so blessed to have you here with us at C and Jenkins. You're in for a treat with our message from our very own Pastor Jerry Cannon. But before we get to it, like this message, share it with someone, and keep in touch with us on our website and Facebook page. Now let's get to it. We hope you enjoy. Getting help with your habit in courage. The story is told of Dustin and Karen Moore when they found themselves on a Southwest airline uh, flight coming back home, and they asked the flight attendant for assistance on how to change their baby. It was an odd kind of request, for it was, Sister Nancy, the first time that, that the flight attendant, Jenny, had ever heard that before, assistance on changing your baby, and they looked at the baby, she looked at it, Jenny, and wondered, why are you traveling with such a small baby? And to her surprise, that was when Dustin and Karen Moore told Jenny that this was their first baby. They had just adopted this baby, and this baby was eight days old, and they did not know how to change a baby. Well, as Jenny went into action, she got on the intercom and she says, look, we have a special guest on our flight today, a newborn eight-year-old baby who has never flown before and as far as I know, being changed for the first time by uh, his parents. And I just want the people on this flight to celebrate with me this newborn on his first flight. And of course, on Southwest Airlines, you know everybody starts clapping and cheering and everything. But not only did she announce this baby's new flight, but then the parents, Dustin and Karen, y'all, they got more encouragement and more instructions on how not just only to change a baby, but they got encouragement and instruction on parenting. People began to start writing notes. People began to start sending little uh, love offerings to them. On the plane, all they wanted was somebody to help them change a dirty diaper, but they got encouragement on how to raise their child. And I don't know if I'm talking to some new parents today or some new grandparents, but I just want to encourage you that if you let somebody know you need some help, help is on the way. If you let somebody know that they can pour into your life, I guarantee you, like Barnabas poured into Paul and Paul poured into Timothy, help is on the way. Help is on the way for somebody coming through a tough time. Help is on the way for somebody coming up the rough side of the mountain. Help is on the way for somebody taking care of an elderly parent. Help is on the way of somebody taking care of a newborn baby. Whatever you stand in the need of, help is on the way. And I want you to hear me this Sunday morning because as we continue our series of sermons on habits, having good habits, making habit a commitment into your life, I, I want to today talk about getting help with your habit with the word of encouragement. Can you shout encouragement? You see, because I want you to recognize, Pastor Rick, you know that when you read the book of Hebrews, there are numerous times listed with the word let us that the writer puts in his writing for the people reading the word to understand. He uses the word let us. Let us always follows an instruction on how to live a solid believer's life. Let us come together. Let us pray. Let us fast. Let us assemble. The Hebrew writer, y'all, he let it be known, let us always come before an instruction on how to live a more wholesome life. And after telling of the, the, these we're worthy hearers that they are to let us come together and assemble, the Bible is really giving us a word today about encouragement. Can you say encouragement? 
encouragement. What is encouragement? Encouragement is something that gives hope, determination, or confidence. Encouragement, it is something that gives hope, something that gives determination, and something that builds up confidence. It, it ties into our habits because, again, repetition being the mother skill of learning, what is a habit? A habit is an acquired behavior pattern uh, regularly followed until it has all, it become almost involuntary. A habit that you have, a good habit that you have of saying grace before you eat. A good habit that you have of saying your prayers before you go to bed. And I do hope I'm looking at somebody this morning who's got a prayer deeper than thou are laying me down to sleep. I ain't hating Dr. Monroe, but I think there's some grown-up folk need to pray a little bit more and thou are laying me down to sleep. And God brings you through a tough day, you ought to say, Lord, thank you. When God lifts you up from a down place, you ought to say, God, thank you. When God makes a way out of nowhere, you ought to say, God, you are a provider. And if you can't do anything else, we're real holy. Just say, won't he do it? You see, the good news, the good news, my friend, is that, is that, that you, you, you have a habit of praying, but also have a habit of being grateful. There, 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 there's much encouragement in the Christian life, y'all, uh, that the Bible instructs us on in this text. And there is much encouragement needed to be, there, excuse me, there is not much encouragement needed to be a spectator, but if a person is going to be effective in their Christian walk, there must be encouragement. Don't miss that because I'm not just wanting to lift up the possibilities of you encouraging one another. I want to put before you today the process as well as a command that we have to encourage one another. Worship to Almighty God is all about encouragement. You see, sometimes we get it twisted, Brother Grant. We think that worship is simply about coming to hear some good music, hear a good sermon, and shake somebody's hand, and back in the day, get some free coffee. Amen. But worship is really about a time and a space for encouragement. Let me say it like this. Being a Christian, y'all, means more than believing something about God. It is also living a life that is motivated by love for Christ. What we believe as a Christian should never be unrelated to our everyday lives. Doctrine is good, deeds are good, constitutions are good, bylaws are good, but none of that has anything to do with how you live your life out, okay, as a child of God. Okay, 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 hey, let me see if I can say it this way. It's important to understand, my friends, that the one thing uh, to be a Christian is one thing to be a Christian, but it's another thing to live the Christian life. Our conduct often does not match our character. I like the way that Dr. Wayne Dreyer puts it in his book, uh, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. He says, you don't need to be better than anyone else. You just need to be better than you used to be. Huh? Does that make sense to you this Sunday morning? I don't have to be better than Brother Jay. I just got to be better than Jerry was on yesterday. I, I don't have to be as holy as somebody else. I've got to be more righteous than what I was on yesterday. If I lied yesterday, please, Lord, don't make me lie today. If I had a nasty attitude yesterday, God, strike that out of my spirit today. God, whatever it is that I did on yesterday, make me better at it today. You see, see, most of us know what it's like sometimes to feel like giving up, to feel like throwing in the towel, to saying, devil, you won. And, and what the writer of the Hebrew book is trying to tell us, y'all, is that at those moments, at those times, at, at those particular crossroads, that's when you need to encourage somebody else. And when you look at Hebrews chapter 10, there are three things that I believe this text teaches us about encouragement and about support 
supporting one another. They are do not lose hope, get stirred up, and be your authentic self. That is, in essence, be the church. You, you've got to don't lose your hope. Uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, you've got to get stirred up for the right kinds of things, and you've got to be your authentic self. And in essence, God is calling us to be the church. And the first thing I want to talk about when it comes from this text, it simply says, do not lose hope. We, we read there's command. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep this promise. The Bible says, Brother Lewis, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. See, first notice, my friends, that we are called to hold fast. That means we are to be intentional about maintaining and holding on to something. Uh, you, you just don't wake up and say, God, whatever you want to do, uh, I might fall. You don't just roll over and say, God, if it is your will, I might just need to lay here and rest a little bit because you really don't need me to do anything today. No, 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 no. When you wake up in the morning, it's, it's God, I'm ready. God, I'm available. God, I'm yours. And then whatever you want to do today, God, I, I just want to be a part of what you are doing. Don't worry about what appointments I have or, or what meetings I got, but God, I want you to go before me. And when you go before me, you make yourself available to me, and I make myself available back to you. You see, what, 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 what exactly are we to hold fast to? We are to hold fast to the confessions of our hope. And we are to also hold fast to them without wavering according to the text. Y'all hear what I'm saying because the Bible is telling us for those who believe and for those who confess, we should never give up and never let go of the one who has brought us thus far. Friends, please hear this because I'm trying to say because of our hope, because of our faith that's not found in a church clique, that's not found in a fellowship group, that's not found in circumstances, not found in titles, it's not found in position, but our hope, my friends, is found on the word of Almighty God. We, that's what we hold fast to. What is our confession that we must confess? Well, let's start with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only son for a sinner like me. What is our confession? Let's go to John 3, 17. For Jesus came to the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. What is our confession? Let's go now, y'all, to Philippians. For it says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Okay, wait a minute. What's our confession? And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment shall not condemn me. What is my confession? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What is my confession? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into heaven but it rose on the third day of all power in his hand. What is our confession? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What is my confession? I'm alive. I'm well. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. What is my confession? Jesus Christ is my Lord. Here. We confess that Christ is the center. And if you don't get nothing else, old school say you just got to confess my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus. And oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to realize that worship is about encouraging folk in their confession. You ought to feel better 
when you leave worship than you came. Okay. Let me, let me say it like this. Faith, here's a quote. Faith makes things possible, but not easy. If you know it's right, it's worth fighting for. But here's where I hang my hat from the words of Dr. King. He says, lightning makes no sound until it strikes. <laughs> that's deep, baby, Mr. That, that's deep right there. But when you know that worship is striking on that element of your life, and you know that worship is striking on that ailment, that, that, that sin, when you know that worship is striking on that, on that mess that's happening, trying to cause you all kinds of confusion, it's going to make some noise. And it makes noise to say, thank you, God. You see, we have no idea what would happen today or tomorrow. We don't know if things are going to get better or if they're going to get worse. But, but we do know that God is faithful. God is merciful. God is gracious. And God will see us through. Somebody say amen. amen. Here's the second thing the text tells us. It says you've got to get stirred up. Say, get stirred up. See, our text, our text, Brother Jamie, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Or as we read it in the English Standard Version, it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works. Notice what it says, y'all. We are to consider how to stir up one another. This does not mean we think about whether or not we want to do it. Rather, it is understood as being intentional and a perception of ways to accomplish something. We, when we think about it, you are saying, God, I, I just wonder what it would look like. No, when you're supposed to be stirring up, you're not saying, wonder what it would look like. It's like, God, whenever you're ready for me to do the stirring, I got my big spoon ready. God, whenever you want me to start doing some poking and prodding, I, I got my word ready. God, when you want me to start laying some word on somebody, I, I, got, I got more than John 11, 35, Jesus wept. I got that God can make a way in my spirit. You see, we got to get beyond the impossibilities and know that all things are possible. I like the quote that Charles Wando Chestnut says. He says, impossibilities are merely things of which we have not learned or which we do not wish to happen. Uh, things that we have not learned or do not wish to happen when we see how God is calling us to be a church and a ministry of inclusivity and a church of intentionality and of a church where whosoever will let them come. And some churches that's not possible uh, because you, you, you dress a certain way. It ain't possible for you to be a member of the church, let alone a leader in the church. Because you're married to a certain person, it's not possible for you to teach Sunday school. But in this church, if you got blood in your body, you got breath in your lungs and you know Jesus, you can start teaching. It, it, it's not possible in some places because of the lifestyle, you know, and I, I found out that people don't want to be in a church where their life is not embraced. Why? Because many times, y'all, we get to the point that if we don't have the skill, we don't think we can do anything. But I just want to affirm in somebody, you have the skill. You can do something. Let's see if I can share it with you this way. Brother L, I was listening to my friend, Brother Goodman. He shared the story about a little girl who was late for dinner one night. And when she came home, her mama got on her case. She said, where you been? You're late for dinner. And she says, oh, mama, I, I'm sorry I'm late because my friend fell off her bike. Her bike broke. So the mama says, well, honey, that's all right, but you don't know nothing about fixing bikes. And she says, mama, I wasn't there to fix her bike. I was there just to help her cry. Amen. 
You can't fix me, but you can sure enough be with me when I'm crying. You can't lift my burden, but you can sure enough come along and say, brother, it's going to be all right. You, you can't walk in my shoes, but I guarantee you, every now and then I might need somebody to help me soak my big old feet. I want somebody to help me, somebody to encourage me, somebody to lift me up. The good news, the good news, y'all, is that, 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 that impossibilities are simply, in the words of Chestnut, the ways to which we have not learned to apply them. I, 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 let me share a word of caution right here, because the Bible says we are to stir up folk, uh, and that is, stir them up for love and good actions. You are not to stir folk up to, up, up to, to raise sand. That's not acts of love and good works. If you are stirring folk up, y'all, in your community, stirring folk up in your job and stirring folk up in your base and they are showing signs of prejudice and division, that's not acts of love and good works. If you are stirring folk up and they want to wallow in the mud and they want to talk about your mistakes and they are living in the past of shoulda, woulda, coulda, friends, that is not stirring them up in acts of love and good works. But look what the Bible teaches us in Matthew chapter 7. It says, when Jesus told his disciples, uh, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay uh, no attention to the plank in your own eye? What he was saying, first take the plank out of your eye. Take the two by four out of your eye to see the speck of sawdust in somebody else's eye. So you see, Jesus was trying to help us understand is that I can't get you all excited to bring somebody else down. What I ought to do is get you pumped up to lift somebody else up. Let, 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 me go back to, let me go back to Brother Charles Chestnut. Brother Charles Chestnut, don't know if you know his story, y'all, born in the 1800s. He was a teacher at the Normal School in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Now, the Normal School, if you know anything about HBCUs, was the pre, pre, pre predecessor word for, for the black colleges for the freed Africans after slavery. There was one in Fayetteville, called, now called Fayetteville State. Charles Chestnut, y'all, had French ancestry. His French ancestry, y'all, uh, and his bloodline made him seven-eighth white. That's what he said. I'm identified seven-eighth white. According to the state of North Carolina, if you got one drop of red blood connected to black folk, you're black. Okay, you didn't get it. Charles Chestnut, y'all, was the author of the, of, the, of the story of the massacre in Wilmington, North Carolina. Now, we know about what happened in Oklahoma. We know about what happened in Florida. But in Wilmington, North Carolina, there was also a massacre. There was a black Wall Street in Wilmington, North Carolina. Charles Chestnut wrote about that. And because of his writings, y'all, he then moved from North Carolina to New York down to Cleveland, y'all, because he was still being chased away. Now, he said, he was seven eighth white. In some place he could have passed for being white. But Charles Chestnut realized that it's not what I say, it's who I am that's important. It's not what I talk about, it's who I become. And he says, I've got the right with liberation. I got the right, right with a sense of, 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 of a proclamation to truth. Charles Chestnut, y'all, as we read his story, oh, I'm so excited about it because it helps me understand even today, y'all, that we have to do some things, as he says, that were impossible that are now become possible. He's helping us realize, y'all, is that, is, is, is that what we are called to do according to verse 24, he says we are to consider of ways that we can motivate one another. His writings, y'all, were ways to motivate freed Africans in rural North Carolina, eastern North Carolina, to pull themselves up, but also to keep their faith and their eyes on Almighty God. What are we to consider? Let me say it again. We are called to stir one another up, to motivate 
motivate and to encourage, to inspire and to promote, to advocate and support. Here it is, not to tear them down, not to degrade them, not to belittle them, not to bring up their past, not to cast doubt on their future, but to stir them up to acts of love and good works. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Come here, Marion Anderson, for you uh, think uh, uh, so well, for you said it like this. I always bear in mind that my mission is to leave behind me the kind of impression that will make it easier for those who follow. My mission, Mary and Anderson, could not sing there at Constitution Hall on that Easter. They could not sing there at a place that was built with the funds of the Daughters of the Confederacy. But Mary and Anderson found herself, y'all, not just singing for 2,000 people in Constitution Hall, but it says 75,000 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It was that Mary and Anderson right there who says, I'm going to leave things better behind me. So when those come, oh, you miss your shout right there. I'm going to encourage somebody. I'm going to knock some doors down. I'm going to beat some walls down. I'm going to be the first one, but won't be the last one. I might be the one to have to take the beating, but I'm going to also be the one that lifts you up when you get your trophy, when you get your recognition. The good news, y'all, is the Bible says those who are called by the name of the Lord are to encourage one another. Let me, let me see. It says we ought to stir them up, stir them up, stir them up. Let me see. It's, it's an illustration like a hornet's nest. Anybody ever found yourself around a hornet's nest? Anybody ever accidentally poked the hornet's nest? Not only did you get stirred up, but you stirred them up. Amen. Did a little bit of research, a little research, Sister Rita, on why the hornets are called a hornet because, I mean, you were a bobcat, so... Don't y'all hate on the bobcats. We, we lost the hornets, got the bobcats, now we got the hornets. Why did they call us the hornets? Well, it's tracked back, y'all, to the 1700s when General Cromwell was simply the one that they said uh, um, that, 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 that the fight against the revolution was so strong that the people in Charlotte, they were like a hornet's nest. When you stir them up, they fought back. You see, the illustration is that we ought to stir people up in the church that's like poking a hornet's less. That when they leave the church, they can't help but to go do something good. When they leave the church, they can't help but to go and serve somebody. When they leave the church, they can't help but to go and to, and, and to do greater things for the Lord. A hornet's nest. Uh, the hornet's nest, the, the imagery, y'all, is that you've got to stir people up to do the right kinds of things. Let me see. Let me see if I can close because I want you to know the last thing it says, we've got to be the church. I call it be your authentic self. For the Bible says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let us not neglect our meeting together. I'm glad y'all are in church in person. I'm glad those are watching online and listening. But the Bible says, let's don't neglect the assembly of my people. Don't, don't come up with an excuse that is raining. Don't you know the same God that blesses you on sunny days blesses you on rainy days? Don't come up with, I'm tired. Don't you know the reason you're tired? Because God gave you a job to go to that made you tired. I, I, I don't know if I got the clothes to wear. God says, naked you came into the world, naked you shall leave. But blessed be the name. Now don't come to church naked, please. Please, please, please. Put something on, because everybody in here ain't saved. Amen. It's saying don't live in excuses. Don't live, make, when you come to church, when you gather to church, we, we gather in the church, y'all, we should be intentional about encouraging one another. What does the psalmist say? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. When you gather the church, somebody ought to be lifting holy hands. Somebody ought to be giving thanks. Somebody ought to be giving praise to God. 
See, a healthy church, y'all, is, is not concerned about your past as they are uh, much concerned about your future. A healthy church is one where a church is Christ-centered and a church that is more involved in how you can become a greater witness. A healthy church, y'all, they're not a church hung up with stuff that does not bring God glory. And as we come back in, I pray that we can check that stuff at the door that we used to do before the pandemic. Okay, let me say it again. People watching right now are watching because they wanted not to come back to the church stuff. They said, if I can get a word online, then I ain't going to come to the church for the church stuff. But I want those online to know we ain't going to do that stuff no more. Come on, just as come on, just as you are. Come on, put some put some clothes on and come on, just as you are. If you're high, come to church anyway, just, just as you are. If you're drunk, come to church just as you are. Oh, don't 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 y'all get all self righteous. Don't don't look at me. Look at me. If I had to put a sin meter at the door to test the people's sin to come in, some of y'all might not show up. Let's do a sin breathalyzer. Come as you are. Say, come as you are. Okay, let me, let me go to my clothes. Because I, I, I've been trying to hold my shout for a little bit, y'all. But I could not, could not, could not help but give thanks to what this day is all about. This day is important because it's a day of encouragement. And, and though I had shared with the AV team and the music staff this series, you, you've seen this text before. But y'all, I can't help but to thank God that, that Senator Cory Booker helped me close my sermon today. <clears throat> I got to thank Senator Cory because Senator Cory gave Judge uh, 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 Katanji Brown Jackson some encouraging words. As he, as he spoke to her uh, the other day. He, he did two videos. The one that really rocked my world was the one in the sweatsuit. But, but he, when he got to the floor, he, he said to her, wow, the power we have to encourage each other, to lift each other up, to sustain ourselves through our struggle. Never underestimate that. The power we have, he says, to, to encourage one another. Never underestimate that. I say, come on, uh, Brother Corey, you, you don't start preaching right there because what he was saying from the book of Hebrews is that when you come to the Lord's house on the Lord's day, you have power to encourage one another. When you come to God's house, assemble with God's people, you have the power to lift somebody up. And your responsibility is never to tear somebody down. Your responsibility is never to get them to acquiesce and to fall in line with the way you want them to fall in line. But your responsibility, my responsibility, is to help somebody be encouraged. For, 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 for Brother Booker said, for the next 30 minutes, I ain't got a question for you at all. I just want to thank God, because when I see you, uh, Judge, you, you look like my mama, my auntie, my cousin. When I see you, Judge, you look like the people that struggle like me. When I see you, Judge, I see myself applying for something and they deny me because of color. When I see you, Judge, I hear my story in your story. He says, I ain't got no questions for you. I just want to give you a word of encouragement. I want you to know, be careful of distractions because distractions are the things that prevent someone from giving their full attention to what they ought to do. He says, be careful because distractions is the destruction of a dream in slow motion. But here's what he says. I want you to know, Judge, that you got to persevere. He says, persevere, because that's not what happened. That same woman told you as you walked across the campus at law school. She says, persevere. You don't know her name. I don't know her name, but I believe her name was sent by God. Why? And here's where the sinner can start preaching. He says, God's got this. God's got your back. God's got the cover. God's got the front. God's got all. Wow, what an incredible message from Pastor Cannon this morning. If today's message touched you and you'd like to get involved here at Seeing It Jenkins, 
be sure to visit our website or connect with us on Facebook. And if you'd like to give to our ministry, you can visit our website, Givelify, text to give, or even bring it down to the church. We're here every Sunday, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So we'd love to see you next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week. Hope in hopeless situations, but most important to a God who says, I got this. May grace, mercy, and peace be with you this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.